Alrighty, welcome back. Uh, my next guest is one of the uh, few producers who's as well known as the stars of his shows. He's given us shows like All in the Family, Maud, The Jeffersons, Sanford and Son, Good Times, many others. He's currently producing movies. And that list includes The Princess Bride, Stand By Me, the current hit uh, Fried Green Tomatoes, and has a new TV show right here on NBC, a subsidiary of General Electric, uh, called The Powers That Be, which airs Saturday at 8.30 right here. Please welcome Norman Lear. <laughs> I must say, that's the phoniest toupee I've seen in years. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's, it's really not a toupee. I just didn't want anybody to know the true I'll, condition. Oh, no, no. It's, a, it's very distinguished. You could do the Players Club ads. <laughs> I'll do it. <laughs> now, this is quite a list of credits here. How do you remain humble here? Look at all this stuff. <laughs> How do you remain humble? Oh, sure, look at all this list you, of stuff you, here. You grow up in, uh, in Connecticut. You have my parents. Oh, yeah? Yes, Connecticut. Some folks from Connecticut? Yeah. And you have my mother. My mother... <laughs> uh, rather than describe, I'll tell, uh, uh, I'll tell you exactly who she is in one quick anecdote. I was, uh, I was told one Sunday morning that I was being uh, inducted into the uh, Television Hall of Fame. The people I was being inducted with included uh, William Paley and David Sarnoff and Lucille Ball and Milton Berle and, and uh, Patty Chevsky and I call my mother, excited, have to tell my mother. So I said, Mother, I just got this telephone call. I'm not even supposed to know it. A friend wanted me to hear it. But they're starting a television hall of fame, and they're inducting me. And, and, uh, and with, with Paley and Sarnoff and Lucille Ball and Milton Berle, she said, listen, if that's what they want to do, who am I to say? <laughs> yeah, no, you, I know, you know, you're never a star in your own home, you know. I get the, I, it's the same thing, you know, it's the same you thing. You get the same mother. Oh, yeah, when I got this job, my mother said, oh, can't you go on another network? I'm going to miss Johnny. I'm gonna, I, said, <laughs> I said, Ma, he's retiring. He's not, oh, could you never he stay make on? Could you, you never do make something it else? With your, with your, uh, with oh, your no. mother, or you struggle for a lifetime. Yeah. I was, uh, I was 60, I think, 60 years old, maybe 59 years old. My mother is in New York. She's coming out to California. <laughs> and, uh, and she's coming out with me to spend some time. I happen to be in New York at the same time. She's in a wheelchair. She's uh, uh, in wonderful shape, but she needs a chair. And I wheel her up onto the plane, get her on the plane. <laughs> and she's telling me as, as I'm wheeling her that she's got some new drops for her eyes. And she has to take them intermittently. Every once in a while, she has to take a drop. And, uh, and we sit down, she's uh, uh, at, at the uh, aisle, so she can get up quickly if she needs to. And I'm at the bulkhead, and a stranger, we're up in the air, we're about 20 minutes, and a strange guy is walking down the aisle. She pulls him by the uh, shirt sleeve, and she's looking into her purse, and she takes out the eye drops, and she says, pardon me, sir, she says, I need an eye drop <laughs> in this eye, and I wonder if you'd be good enough to so the guy's a nice man, he takes yeah. out an eye drop, he puts it in her eye, and he moves on, and I'm sitting there. And I said, Mother, why did you ask a stranger to put an eye drop <laughs> in, in your eye? And she said, well, you have to be very careful. <laughs> so, so I said, but I'm 59 years old, I can be careful, I know how to do that. She said, well, you have to be very patient. I said, Mother, she said, look at that, that's some patience. <laughs> Funny. I, you know, it is too. My mother is the, also the only person that ever told the flight attendant that the meal was delicious. <laughs> it was so good. <laughs> My mother told the flight they, everything was delicious. But, all, but first thing she said when, I, when we get on a plane or any place together is, you know who this is? <laughs> yeah. huh? You know who this is? <laughs> just, and then, mother, please, please, please. And then the people go, no, who is it? And now you look like an idiot. I had a father who was the same, guy, the, the same way. When I was a kid, he took me in for my first haircut. It was a, 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 obviously a long time ago, <laughs> and it was a, quite a one job. Of those, yeah, one of those long, one of those long uh, 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 barber shops. Right. You know, eight barbers lined up in a row, very narrow. My father opens the door. I'm at his knee, and he says, "Here's Norman." Before here's Johnny. Yeah. He says, "Here's Norman," and I'm begging him, D "Don't do this. Don't announce me this way." I'm four or five years old, but here's Norman. <laughs> Now, you started out as a, as a comedy writer also, right? 
I still write. No, I don't mean that way. I mean writing yeah. gags. I don't mean writing sitcoms. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, I mean yeah. writing jokes. I mean, I know writing you're jokes, a writer, writing stand up. Did you write stand up for anybody? Any yeah. of the famous comedians? I wrote, uh, <laughs> Ed Simmons and I were partners, and, uh, and we wrote something for, uh, the first thing we wrote and sold for more than $40 or $35. We had an idea one day for Danny Thomas, and, uh, and Thomas. Uh, we knew had the, was with the William Morris office. So I called the William Morris office as fast as I could talk. There was no way we alone could get his number, find out how the hell to reach him. So uh, I called, the, I, I got a secretary on the phone as fast as I could talk. I said, uh, uh, this is Norman Lear, I'm at the airport now. I've been out here for three days. I'm with the New York Times. I've been talking to Danny Thomas, uh, doing a big story. I'm gonna file it as soon as I get to New York and I'm gonna be writing it on the airplane. I have two questions to ask him and some nervous person gave me his phone number. Oh, that's so, pretty good. So I called him at home uh, and said, uh, introduced myself. He loved the way we got to him. And, uh, and he said, look, he said, I'm doing something at uh, Ciro's, Friars Frolic. Everybody knows my routines. This is an inside group. Uh, if, if, if you've got something, can run five minutes and I can use it. I said, it's just five minutes. He said, get out here right away. I said, well, it's going to take a couple hours to get out there. He said, why? You said you're in Hollywood. I see we hadn't written it yet. <laughs> <laughs> Just had the oh, idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Never yeah. thought we'd get this far. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, we uh, we sailed out to uh, anyway. Sold it to him. Paid five hundred dollars. Said he'd give me another thousand if it worked. Used oh. it for eleven years after that. Boy, that's pretty. And good. gave the thousand dollars many times to St. Jude. Oh yeah. Well, he was always a good guy. He was a terrific guy. Let me ask you about the new show now. It's uh, this is pretty. This is the kind of thing I like oh. about a ooh goofy politician. There we. We have yeah, a clip. So. Does it need some setup? Well, you just have to think. Uh, we view him as uh, as just uh, your typical empty suit politician. We see a lot of them these days. Hard to imagine, huh? And yeah. uh, it speaks for itself. All right, let's take a look. <laughs> I thought I was watching the news for a minute. Norman Lear, be right back right after this.